The Secret Intelligence Service CIS, commonly known as MI6, is the Foreign Intelligence Service of the Government of the United Kingdom, tasked mainly with the covert overseas collection and analysis of human intelligence in support of the UK's national security. CIS is a member of the country's intelligence community and its chief is accountable to the country's foreign secretary, formed in 1909 as a section of the Secret Service Bureau specializing in foreign intelligence. The section experienced dramatic growth during World War I and officially adopted its current name around 1920. The name MI6 meaning military intelligence, Section 6 originated as a flag of convenience during World War II, when CIS was known by many names, it is still commonly used today. The existence of CIS was not officially acknowledged until 1994. That year the Intelligence Services Act 1994 was introduced to Parliament, to place the organization on a statutory footing for the first time, it provides the legal basis for its operations. Today, CIS is subject to public oversight by the Investigatory Powers Tribunal and the Parliamentary Intelligence and Security Committee. The stated priority roles of CIS are counter-terrorism, counter-proliferation, providing intelligence in support of cybersecurity, and supporting stability overseas to disrupt terrorism and other criminal activities. Unlike its main sister agencies, the Security Service MI5 and Government Communications Headquarters GCHQ, CIS works exclusively in foreign intelligence gathering. The ESA allows it to carry out operations only against persons outside the British Islands. Some of CIS's actions since the 2000s have attracted significant controversy, such as its alleged acts of torture and extraordinary rendition. Since 1995, CIS has been headquartered in the CIS building in London, on the south bank of the River Thames. Topic: History and development. Topic: Foundation. The service derived from the Secret Service Bureau, which was founded in 1909. The Bureau was a joint initiative of the Admiralty and the War Office to control secret intelligence operations in the UK and overseas, particularly concentrating on the activities of the Imperial German government. The Bureau was split into naval and army sections which, over time, specialised in foreign espionage and internal counter-espionage activities, respectively. This specialization was because the Admiralty wanted to know the maritime strength of the Imperial German Navy. This specialization was formalized before 1914. During the First World War in 1916, the two sections underwent administrative changes so that the foreign section became the section MI1 of the Directorate of Military Intelligence. Its first director was Captain Sir Mansfield George Smith Cumming, who often dropped the Smith in routine communication. He typically signed correspondence with his initial C in green ink. This usage evolved as a code name, and has been adhered to by all subsequent directors of CIS when signing documents to retain anonymity. <laughs> First World War The service's performance during the First World War was mixed, because it was unable to establish a network in Germany itself. Most of its results came from military and commercial intelligence collected through networks in neutral countries, occupied territories, and Russia. Interwar period After the war, resources were significantly reduced but during the 1920s, CIS established a close operational relationship with the diplomatic service. In August 1919, Cumming created the new Passport Control Department, providing diplomatic cover for agents abroad. The post of Passport Control Officer provided operatives with diplomatic immunity, circulating sections established intelligence requirements and passed the intelligence back to its consumer departments, mainly the War Office and Admiralty. The debate over the future structure of British intelligence continued at length after the end of hostilities but Cumming managed to engineer the return of the service to Foreign Office control. At this time, the organization was known in Whitehall by a variety of titles including the Foreign Intelligence Service, the Secret Service, MI1, C, the Special Intelligence Service and even C's organization. Around 1920, it began increasingly to be referred to as the Secret Intelligence Service, CIS, a title that it has continued to use to the present day and which was enshrined in statute in the Intelligence Services Act 1994. 
During the Second World War, the name MI6 was used as a flag of convenience, the name by which it is frequently known in popular culture since, in the immediate post-war years under Sir Mansfield George Smith coming and throughout most of the 1920s, CIS was focused on communism, in particular, Russian Bolshevism. Examples include a thwarted operation to overthrow the Bolshevik government in 1918 by CIS agents Sidney George Riley and Sir Robert Bruce Lockhart, as well as more orthodox espionage efforts within early Soviet Russia headed by Captain George Hill. Smith Cumming died suddenly at his home on 14 June 1923, shortly before he was due to retire, and was replaced as C by Admiral Sir Hugh Quex Sinclair. Sinclair created the following sections. A Central Foreign Counter Espionage Circulating Section, Section V, to liaise with the Security Service to collate counter espionage reports from overseas stations. An Economic Intelligence Section, Section 7, to deal with trade, industry, and contraband. A Clandestine Radio Communications Organization, Section 8, to communicate with operatives and agents overseas. Section N to exploit the contents of foreign diplomatic bags. Section D to conduct political covert actions and paramilitary operations in time of war. Section D would organize the Home Defense Scheme Resistance Organization in the UK and come to be the foundation of the Special Operations Executive SOE during the Second World War, with the emergence of Germany as a threat following the ascendance of the Nazis. In the early 1930s, attention was shifted in that direction. MI6 assisted the Gestapo, the Nazi secret police, with the exchange of information about communism. As late as October 1937, well into the Nazi era, the head of the British agency's Berlin station, Frank Foley, was still able to describe his relationship with the Gestapo's so-called communism expert as cordial. Sinclair died in 1939, after an illness, and was replaced as C by L.T. Call. Stuart Menzies Horse Guards, who had been with the service since the end of World War I on 26 and 27 July 1939, in Pirie near Warsaw, British military intelligence representatives including Dilly Knox, Alistair Deniston and Humphrey Sandwith were introduced by their allied Polish counterparts into their Enigma decryption techniques and equipment, including Zygalski sheets and the cryptologic Bomba, and were promised future delivery of a reverse-engineered, Polish-built duplicate Enigma machine. The demonstration represented a vital basis for the later British continuation and effort. During the war, British cryptologists decrypted a vast number of messages enciphered on Enigma. The intelligence gleaned from this source, codenamed Ultra, by the British, was a substantial aid to the Allied war effort. Topic Second World War During the Second World War the human intelligence work of the service was complemented by several other initiatives, the cryptanalytic effort undertaken by the Government Code and Cipher School GC and CS, the bureau responsible for interception and decryption of foreign communications at Bletchley Park, see above, the extensive double cross system run by MI5 to feed misleading intelligence to the Germans. Imagery intelligence activities conducted by the RAF Photographic Reconnaissance Unit now JARIC, the National Imagery Exploitation Center, GC and CS was the source of ultra-intelligence, which was very useful. The chief of CIS, Stuart Menzies insisted on wartime control of codebreaking, and this gave him immense power and influence, which he used judiciously. By distributing the ultra-material collected by the Government Code and Cipher School, for the first time, MI6 became an important branch of the government. Extensive breaches of Nazi Enigma signals gave Menzies and his team enormous insight into Adolf Hitler's strategy, and this was kept a closely held secret. The British intelligence services signed a special agreement with their allied Polish counterparts 1940. In July 2005, the British and Polish governments jointly produced a two tome study of bilateral intelligence cooperation in the war, which revealed information that had until then been officially secret. The report of the Anglo-Polish Historical Committee was written by leading historians and experts who had been granted unprecedented access to British intelligence archives, and concluded that 48% of all reports received by British secret services from continental Europe in 1939-45 had come from Polish sources. This was facilitated by the fact that occupied Poland had a tradition of insurgency organizations passed down through generations, with networks in émigré Polish communities in Germany and France. A major part of Polish resistance activity was clandestine and involved cellular intelligence networks, while Nazi Germany used Poles as forced laborers across the continent, putting them in a unique position to spy on the enemy. 
Liaison was undertaken by CIS officer Wilfred Dunderdale, and reports included advanced warning of the Afrika Corps' departure for Libya, awareness of the readiness of Vichy French units to fight against the Allies or switch sides in Operation Torch, and advance warning both of Operation Barbarossa and Operation Edelweiss, the German Caucasus campaign. Polish sourced reporting on German secret weapons began in 1941, and Operation Wildhorn enabled a British Special Operations flight to airlift a V-2 rocket that had been captured by the Polish resistance. Polish secret agent Jan Karski delivered the British the first Allied intelligence on the Holocaust. Via a female Polish agent, the British also had a channel to the anti Nazi chief of the Abwehr, Admiral Wilhelm Canaris. The most significant failure of the service during the war was known as the Venlo Incident, named for the Dutch town where much of the operation took place. Agents of the German Army Secret Service, the Abwehr, and the counter espionage section of the Sicherheitsdienst SD, posed as high ranking officers involved in a plot to depose Hitler. In a series of meetings between CIS agents and the conspirators, SS plans to abduct the CIS team were shelved due to the presence of Dutch police. On the night of 8-9 November 1939, a meeting took place without police presence. There, the two CIS agents were duly abducted by the SS. In 1940, journalist and Soviet agent Kim Philby applied for a vacancy in Section D of CIS, and was vetted by his friend and fellow Soviet agent Guy Burgess. When Section D was absorbed by Special Operations Executive SOE in summer of 1940, Philby was appointed as an instructor in the arts of black propaganda at the SOE's training establishment in Beaulieu, Hampshire. In May 1940, MI6 set up British Security Coordination BSC on the authorization of Prime Minister Winston Churchill over the objections of Stuart Menzies. This was a covert organization based in New York City, headed by William Stevenson intended to investigate enemy activities, prevent sabotage against British interests in the Americas, and mobilize pro-British opinion in the Americas. BSC also founded Camp 10 in Canada to train clandestine operators and to establish in 1942 a telecommunications relay station, code name Hydra, operated by engineer Benjamin DeForest Bailey. In early 1944, MI6 re-established Section X, its pre-war anti-Soviet section, and Philby took a position there. He was able to alert the NKVD about all British intelligence on the Soviets including what the American OSS had shared with the British about the Soviets. Despite these difficulties the service nevertheless conducted substantial and successful operations in both occupied Europe and in the Middle East and Far East where it operated under the cover name Inter-Service Liaison Department ISLD. Cold War In August 1945 Soviet intelligence officer Konstantin Volkov tried to defect to the UK, offering the names of all Soviet agents working inside British intelligence. Philby received the memo on Volkov's offer and alerted the Soviets, so they could arrest him. In 1946, CIS absorbed the rump remnant of the Special Operations Executive SOE, dispersing the latter's personnel and equipment between its operational divisions or controllerates and new directorates for training and development and for war planning. The 1921 arrangement was streamlined with the geographical, operational units redesignated, production sections, sorted regionally under controllers, all under a director of production. The circulating sections were renamed, requirements sections, and placed under a directorate of requirements. CIS operations against the USSR were extensively compromised by the presence of an agent working for the Soviet Union, Harold Adrian Russell, Kim, Philby, in the post-war counter-espionage section, R5. CIS suffered further embarrassment when it turned out that an officer involved in both the Vienna and Berlin tunnel operations had been turned as a Soviet agent during internment by the Chinese during the Korean War. This agent, George Blake, returned from his internment to be treated as something of a hero by his contemporaries in the office. His security authorization was restored, and in 1953 he was posted to the Vienna station where the original Vienna tunnels had been running for years. After compromising these to his Soviet controllers, he was subsequently assigned to the British team involved on Operation Gold, the Berlin Tunnel, and which was, consequently, blown from the outset. 
In 1956, CIS director John Alexander Sinclair had to resign after the botched affair of the death of Lionel Crabb. CIS activities included a range of covert political actions, including the overthrow of Mohammad Mossadegh in Iran in the 1953 Iranian coup d'état in collaboration with the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. Despite earlier Soviet penetration, CIS began to recover as a result of improved vetting and security, and a series of successful penetrations. From 1958, CIS had three moles in the Polish UB, the most successful of which was codenamed Nadi. The CIA described the information CIS received from these poles as, "...some of the most valuable intelligence ever collected," and rewarded CIS with $20 million to expand their Polish operation. In 1961 Polish defector Michael Golanuski exposed George Blake as a Soviet agent. Blake was identified, arrested, tried for espionage and sent to prison. He escaped and was exfiltrated to the USSR in 1966. Also, in the GRU, they recruited Colonel Oleg Penkovsky. Penkovsky ran for two years as a considerable success, providing several thousand photographed documents, including Red Army rocketry manuals that allowed U.S. National Photographic Interpretation Center NPIC analysts to recognize the deployment pattern of Soviet SS-4 MRBMs and SS-5 IRBMs in Cuba in October 1962. CIS operations against the USSR continued to gain pace through the remainder of the Cold War, arguably peaking with the recruitment in the 1970s of Oleg Gordievsky whom CIS ran for the better part of a decade, then successfully exfiltrated from the USSR across the Finnish border in 1985. The real scale and impact of CIS activities during the second half of the Cold War remains unknown, however, because the bulk of their most successful targeting operations against Soviet officials were the result of third country. Operations recruiting Soviet sources traveling abroad in Asia and Africa. These included the defection to the Sisteron station in 1982 of KGB officer Vladimir Kuzichkin, the son of a senior Politburo member and a member of the KGB's internal second chief directorate who provided CIS and the British government with warning of the mobilization of the KGB's Alpha Force during the 1991 August coup which briefly toppled Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. Topic. After the Cold War The end of the Cold War led to a reshuffle of existing priorities. The Soviet bloc ceased to swallow the lion's share of operational priorities, although the stability and intentions of a weakened but still nuclear-capable federal Russia constituted a significant concern. Instead, functional rather than geographical intelligence requirements came to the fore such as counterproliferation via the agency's production and targeting, counterproliferation section which had been a sphere of activity since the discovery of Pakistani physics students studying nuclear weapons-related subjects in 1974, counterterrorism via two joint sections run in collaboration with the Security Service, one for Irish republicanism and one for international terrorism, counter-narcotics and serious crime originally set up under the Western Hemisphere Controller Rate in 1989, and a «Global Issues» section looking at matters such as the environment and other public welfare issues. In the mid-1990s these were consolidated into a new post of controller, global and functional, during the transition, then C. Sir Colin McColl embraced a new, albeit limited, policy of openness towards the press and public, with «public affairs» falling into the brief of director, counterintelligence and security renamed director, security and public affairs. McColl's policies were part and parcel with a wider open government initiative developed from 1993 by the government of John Major. As part of this, CIS operations, and those of the National Signals Intelligence Agency, GCHQ, were placed on a statutory footing through the 1994 Intelligence Services Act. Although the Act provided procedures for authorizations and warrants, this essentially enshrined mechanisms that had been in place at least since 1953 for authorizations and 1985 under the Interception of Communications Act, for warrants. Under this Act, since 1994, CIS and GCHQ activities have been subject to scrutiny by Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee. During the mid 1990s, the British intelligence community was subjected to a comprehensive costing review by the government. As part of broader defense cutbacks CIS had its resources cut back 25% across the board and senior management was reduced by 40%. As a consequence of these cuts, the Requirements Division formerly the circulating sections of the 1921 arrangement were deprived of any representation on the board of directors. 
At the same time, the Middle East and Africa controllerates were pared back and amalgamated. According to the findings of Lord Butler of Brockwell's review of weapons of mass destruction, the reduction of operational capabilities in the Middle East and of the requirements division's ability to challenge the quality of the information the Middle East Controllerate was providing weakened the Joint Intelligence Committee's estimates of Iraq's non-conventional weapons programs. These weaknesses were major contributors to the UK's erroneous assessments of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction prior to the 2003 invasion of that country. Topic. War on Terror During the Global War on Terror, CIS accepted information from the CIA that was obtained through torture, including the Extraordinary Rendition Program. Craig Murray, a UK ambassador to Uzbekistan, had written several memos critical of the UK's accepting this information. He was then sacked from his job. CIS members were present in Afghanistan during the 2001 invasion following the September 11 attacks. After members of the 22nd Special Air Service (SAS) regiment returned to the UK in mid-December 2001, members of both territorial SAS regiments remained in the country to provide close protection to CIS members. In the run-up to the invasion of Iraq in 2000. Three, it is alleged, although not confirmed, that some CIS conducted Operation Mass Appeal which was a campaign to plant stories about Iraq's WMDs in the media. The operation was exposed in the Sunday Times in December 2003. Claims by former weapons inspector Scott Ritter suggest that similar propaganda campaigns against Iraq date back well into the 1990s. Ritter says that CIS recruited him in 1997 to help with the propaganda effort. The aim was to convince the public that Iraq was a far greater threat than it actually was. Towards the end of the invasion, CIS agents operating out of Baghdad International Airport with Special Air Service SAS protection, began to re-establish a station in Baghdad and began gathering intelligence, in particular on WMDs. After it became clear that Iraq did not possess any WMDs, MI6 had to officially withdraw pre-invasion intelligence about them. In the months after the invasion, they also began gathering political intelligence, predicting what would happen in post-Baathist Iraq. MI6 personnel in the country never exceed 50. In early 2004, apart from supporting Task Force Black and hunting down former senior Baathist party members, MI6 also made an effort to target transnational terrorism. Jihadist network that led to the SAS carrying out Operation Aston in February 2004, they conducted a raid on a house in Baghdad that was part of a jihadist pipeline that ran from Iran to Iraq that US and UK intelligence agencies were tracking suspects on. The raid captured members of Pakistan based terrorist group. Shortly before the Second Battle of Fallujah, MI6 personnel visited JSOC's TSF temporary screening facility at Balad to question a suspected insurgent. Afterwards they raised concern about the poor detention conditions there and as a result the British government informed JSOC in Iraq that prisoners captured by British special forces would only turn them over to JSOC if there was an undertaking not to send them to Balad. In spring 2005, the SAS detachment operating in Basra and southern Iraq, known as Operation Hather, escorted MI6 case officers into Basra so they could meet their sources and handlers and MI6 provided information that enabled the detachment to carry out surveillance operations. MI6 were also involved in resolving the Basra prison incident. The CIS played a central role in the British withdrawal from Basra in 2007. In July 2011, it was reported that CIS has closed several of its stations in the past couple of years, particularly in Iraq, where it used to have several outposts in the south of the country in the region of Basra, according to the annual report of the Parliamentary Intelligence and Security Committee. The closures have allowed the service to focus its attention on Pakistan and Afghanistan, which are its principal stations. On 12 July 2011, MI6 intelligence officers, along with other intelligence agencies tracked two British Afghans to a hotel in Herat, Afghanistan who were discovered to be trying to establish contact. With the Taliban or Al Qaeda to learn bomb making skills, operators from the SAS arrested captured them, and they are believed to be the first Britons to be captured alive in Afghanistan since 2001. In October 2013, CIS appealed for reinforcements and extra staff from other intelligence agencies amid growing concern about a terrorist threat from Afghanistan and that the country will become an intelligence vacuum. 
After British troops withdraw at the end of 2014, in March 2016, it was reported that MI6 had been involved in the Libyan civil war since January of that year, escorted by the SAS, to meet with Libyan officials to discuss the supplying of weapons and training for the Syrian army and the militias fighting against ISIS. In April 2016, it was revealed that MI6 teams with members of the Special Reconnaissance Regiment seconded to them had been deployed to Yemen to train Yemeni forces fighting AQAP, as well as identifying targets for drone strikes. In November 2016, The Independent reported that MI6, MI5 and GCHQ supplied the SAS and other British special forces as part of a multinational special forces operation a list compiled from intelligence of 200 British jihadists to kill or capture before they attempt to return to the UK. The 200 male and female jihadists are senior members of ISIS that pose a direct threat to the UK. Sources said SAS soldiers have been told that the mission could be the most important in the regiment's 75 year history. Other activities On 6 May 2004 it was announced that Sir Richard Dearlove was to be replaced as head of CIS by John Scarlett, former chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee. Scarlett was an unusually high-profile appointment to the job, and gave evidence at the Hutton Inquiry. CIS has been active in the Balkans, playing a vital role in hunting down people wanted by the International War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague. British intelligence operations in the Balkans are thought to have played a vital role in the handover of the former Yugoslav president Slobodan Milosevic to The Hague. CIS has also been heavily involved in the hunt for Radovan Karadzic and General Ratko Miladic, who are linked to a vast range of war crimes, including the murder of Srebrenica's surrendering male population and organizing the siege of Sarajevo. On 27 September 2004, it was reported that British spies across the Balkans, including a CIS, was chief officer in Belgrade. Belgrade and another spy in Sarajevo, were moved or forced to withdraw after they were publicly identified in a number of media reports planted by disgruntled local intelligence services, particularly in Croatia and Serbia. A third individual was branded a British spy in the Balkans and left the office of the High Representative in Bosnia, whilst a further two British intelligence officers working in the Zagreb, remained in place despite their cover being blown in the local press. The exposure of the agents across the three capitals has markedly undermined the British intelligence operations in the area, including CIS efforts to capture The Hague's most wanted men, which riled many local intelligence agencies in the Balkans, some of which are suspected of continuing ties to alleged war criminals. They were riled due to MI6 operating, not so much a spy network as a network of influence within Balkan security services and the media said the director of the International Crisis Group in Serbia and Bosnia, which caused some of them to be upset. In Serbia, the CIS station chief was forced to leave his post August 2004 after a campaign against him led by country's DB intelligence agency, where his work investigating the 2003 assassination of the reformist Prime Minister Zoran Džinjic won him few friends. On 15 November 2006, CIS allowed an interview with current operations officers for the first time. The interview was on the Colin Murray show on BBC Radio 1. The two officers one male and one female had their voices disguised for security reasons. The officers compared their real experience with the fictional portrayal of CIS in the James Bond films. While denying that there ever existed a license to kill and reiterating that CIS operated under British law, the officers confirmed that there is a Q-like figure who is head of the technology department, and that their director is referred to as C. The officers described the lifestyle as quite glamorous and very varied, with plenty of overseas travel and adventure, and described their role primarily as intelligence gatherers, developing relationships with potential sources. Sir John Sowers became head of the CIS in November 2009, the first outsider to head CIS in more than 40 years. Sowers came from the diplomatic service, previously having been the British permanent representative to the United Nations. On the 7th of June 2011, John Sowers received Romania's President Traian Bashescu and George Christian Maller, the head of the Servicial Roman de Informatie at CIS headquarters. Five years before the Libyan civil war, a UK special forces unit was formed called E Squadron, which was composed of selected members of the 22nd SAS Regiment, the SBS, and the SRR. It was tasked by the Director Special Forces to support MI6 operations akin to the CIA's SAD, a covert paramilitary unit for CIS. 
It was not a formal squadron within the establishment of any individual UK Special Forces unit, but at the disposal of both the Director Special Forces and the CIS. Previously, CIS relied primarily on contractor personnel. The squadron carried out missions that required maximum discretion in places that were off the radar or considered dangerous. The squadron's members often operated in plain clothes, with the full range of national support, such as false identities at its disposal. In early March 2011, during the Libyan Civil War, a covert operation in Libya involving E Squadron went wrong. The aim of the mission was to cement CIS's contacts with the rebels by flying in two CIS agents in a Chinook helicopter to meet a Libyan intermediary in a town near Benghazi, who had thereafter promised to fix them up a meeting with the NTC. A team consisting of six E Squadron members all from the SAS and two CIS officers were flown into Libya by an RAF Special Forces Flight Chinook. The squadron's members were carrying bags containing arms, ammunition, explosives, computers, maps and passports from at least four nationalities. Despite technical backup, the team landed in Libya without any prior agreement with the rebel leadership. The plan failed as soon as the team landed. The locals became suspicious they were foreign mercenaries or spies and the team was detained by rebel forces and taken to a military base in Benghazi. They were then hauled before a senior rebel leader. The team told them that they were in the country to find out the rebels' needs and to offer assistance, but the discovery of British troops on the ground enraged the rebels who were fearful that Gaddafi would use such evidence to destroy the credibility of the NTC. Negotiations between senior rebel leaders and British officials in London finally led to their release and they were allowed to board HMS Cumberland. On 16 November 2011 CIS warned the National Transitional Council in Benghazi after discovering details of planned strikes, said Foreign Secretary William Haig. The agencies obtained firm intelligence, were able to warn the NTC of the threat, and the attacks were prevented, he said. In a rare speech on the intelligence agencies, he praised the key role played by CIS and GCHQ in bringing Gaddafi's 42-year dictatorship to an end, describing them as vital assets with a fundamental and indispensable role in keeping the nation safe. They worked to identify key political figures, develop contacts with the emerging opposition and provide political and military intelligence. Most importantly, they saved lives, he said. The speech follows criticism that CIS had been too close to the Libyan regime and was involved in the extraordinary rendition of anti-Gaddafi activists. Mr. Haig also defended controversial proposals for secrecy in civil court involving intelligence material. The Daily Star reported in November 2011 that CIS helped capture Saif al-Islam Gaddafi. The top secret mission, dubbed Operation X to disguise its purpose, used modern electronic intelligence e technologies to bug him along with his friends and family. Gaddafi had been hiding out in the desert for a month but the breakthrough came when he made two phone calls, one after the other, to say he was safe. It allowed the joint British and French bugging operation to pinpoint his location. CIS agents using the £25 million top secret equipment closed in on him before calling in the Libyan Snatch Squad to apprehend him. In February 2013, Channel 4 News reported on evidence of CIS spying on opponents of the Gaddafi regime and handing the information to the regime in Libya. The files looked at contained a memorandum of understanding, dating from October 2002, detailing a two-day meeting in Libya between Gaddafi's external intelligence agency and two senior heads of CIS and one from MI5 outlining joint plans for intelligence exchange, counter-terrorism and mutual cooperation. In February 2015, The Telegraph reported that MI6 contacted their counterparts in the South African intelligence services to seek assistance in an effort to recruit a North Korean asset to spy on North Korea's nuclear program. MI6 had contacted the man who had inside information on North Korea's nuclear program, he considered the offer and wanted to arrange another meeting, but a year passed without MI6 hearing from him, which prompted them to request South African assistance when they learned he would be traveling through South Africa. It is not known whether the North Korean man ever agreed to work for MI6. Topic. Buildings. Topic. CIS headquarters Since 1995, CIS headquarters has been at 85 Vauxhall Cross, along the Albert Embankment in Vauxhall on the south bank of the River Thames by Vauxhall Bridge, London. 
Previous headquarters have been Century House, 100 Westminster Bridge Road, Lambeth 1966 to 1995, and 54 Broadway, off Victoria Street, London 1924 to 1966. Although CIS operated from Broadway, it was actually based at St. James's Street and also made considerable use of the adjoining St. Airman's Hotel. The building was designed by Sir Terry Farrell and built by John Lawing. The developer Rigalian Properties approached the government in 1987 to see if they had any interest in the proposed building. At the same time, MI5 was seeking alternative accommodation and co-location of the two services was studied. In the end this proposal was abandoned due to the lack of buildings of adequate size existing or proposed and the security considerations of providing a single target for attacks. In December 1987, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's government approved the purchase of the new building for CIS. The building design was reviewed to incorporate the necessary protection for the UK's Foreign Intelligence Gathering Agency. This includes overall increased security, extensive computer suites, technical areas, bomb blast protection, emergency backup systems and protection against electronic eavesdropping. While the details and cost of construction have been released, about 10 years after the original National Audit Office now report was written, some of the service's special requirements remain classified. The now report Thames House and Vauxhall Cross has certain details omitted, describing in detail the cost and problems of certain modifications, but not what these are. Rob Humphreys London, the rough guide suggests one of these omitted modifications is a tunnel beneath the Thames to Whitehall. The now put the final cost at £135.05 million for site purchase and the basic building, or £152.6 million including the service's special requirements. The setting of the CIS offices was featured in the James Bond films Goldeneye, The World Is Not Enough, Die Another Day, Skyfall and Spectre. CIS allowed filming of the building itself for the first time in the world is not enough for the pre credit sequence, where a bomb hidden in a briefcase full of money is detonated inside the building. A Daily Telegraph article said that the British government opposed the filming, but this was denied by a Foreign Office spokesperson. In Skyfall the building is once again attacked by an explosion, this time by a cyber attack turning on a gas line and igniting the fumes, after which CIS operations are moved to a secret underground facility. In Spectre, the evil head of crime organization Spectre, Ernst Stavro Blofeld, traps agent 007 James Bond alongside the film's Bond girl Dr. Madeleine Swan inside the remains of the building. Blofeld then detonated bombs planted in the building, demolishing what was left of the building fully, though Bond managed to save Dr. Swan and escape before the building exploded. On the evening of 20 September 2000, the building was attacked using a Russian built RPG 22 anti tank rocket launcher. Striking the eighth floor, the missile caused only superficial damage. The Metropolitan Police Anti-Terrorist Branch attributed responsibility to the real IRA. Topic other buildings Most other buildings are held or nominally occupied by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. They include, Hanslope Park, on the outskirts of Milton Keynes Housing Her Majesty's Government Communications Centre, which supports the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the British intelligence community. Fort Moncton, a former fort dating from the 1780s, rebuilt in the 1880s, is now the Field Operations Training Center for CIS. Topic the Circus MI6 is nicknamed the Circus. Some say this was coined by John Le Carre former CIS officer David Cornwell in his espionage novels and named after a fictional building on Cambridge Circus. Leo Marx explains in his World War II memoir Between Silk and Cyanide that the name arose because a section of the Special Operations Executive was housed in a building at 1 Dorset Square, London, which had formerly belonged to the directors of Bertram Mill Circus. This inspired continuity was one of SOE's favourite in jokes. Topic Chiefs 1909-1923, Sir Mansfield Smith Cumming, 1923-1939, Admiral Sir Hugh Sinclair, 1939-1952, Major General Sir Stuart Menzies, 1953-1956, Sir John Alexander Sinclair, 1956-1968, Sir Richard White, 1968-1973, Sir John Rennie, 1973-1973, 
1978, Sir Maurice Oldfield, 1979–1982, Sir Dick Franks, 1982–1985, Sir Colin Figures, 1985–1989, Sir Christopher Kerwin, 1989–1994, Sir Colin McColl, 1994–1999, Sir David Spedding, 1999–2004, Sir Richard Dearlove, 2004–2009, Sir John Scarlett, 2009 to 2014 Sir John Sowers 2014 present Alex Younger topic see also topic references topic bibliography Aldrich Richard J 2006 the hidden hand Britain America and Cold War secret intelligence London John Murray ISBN 1 58567 274 2 Aldrich Richard J and Rory Cormack 2016 the black door spies secret intelligence and British Prime Ministers London Collins ISBN 978-0007555444 Atkin, Malcolm Fighting Nazi Occupation, British Resistance 1939–1945. Barnsley, Pen and Sword. ISBN 978-1-47383-377-7. Bethel, N. 1984, The Great Betrayal, The Untold Story of Kim Philby's Biggest Coup, London, Hodder and Stoughton ISBN 978-0340357019 Borovic, G. 1994, The Philby Files, London, Little and Brown ISBN 978-0316102841 Bauer, Tom, 1995, The Perfect English Spy, Sir Dick White and the Secret War, 1939-90 London, Hyman ISBN 978-0749323325 Bristow, Desmond with Bill Bristow, 1993 A Game of Moles, The Deceptions of an MI6 Officer, London, Little, Brown ISBN 978-0316903356 Cave Brown, A, 1987 C, The Secret Life of Sir Stuart Graham Menzies, Spymaster to Winston Churchill, Macmillan ISBN 978-0020491316 6 Cavendish, A. 1990 Inside Intelligence, HarperCollins ISBN 978-0002157421 Carrera, G. 2013 The Art of Betrayal, The Secret History of MI6, Pegasus Books ISBN 978-1453271599 Davies, Philip H. J. 2004. MI6 and the Machinery of Spying London, Frank Cass, ISBN 0-7146-8363-9 H. B. Davies, Philip H. J. 2005 the Machinery of Spying Breaks Down in Studies in Intelligence Summer 2005 Declassified Edition. Deacon, Richard 1985, C. A Biography of Sir Maurice Oldfield, MacDonald ISBN 978-0356104003 Dorrell, Stephen 2001, MI6, 50 Years of Special Operations London, 4th Estate, ISBN 1-85702-701-9 Hastings, Max 2015. The Secret War, Spies, Codes and Guerrillas 1939-1945. London, William Collins. ISBN 978-0-00-750374-2. Hayes, P. 2015, Queen of Spies, Daphne Park, Britain's Cold War Spy Master, Duckworth ISBN 978-0715650431 Hermiston, R. 2014, The Greatest Traitor, The Secret Lives of Agent George Blake, London, Orem ISBN 978-1781310465 Humphreys, Rob, 1999, London, The Rough Guide, Rough Guides, ISBN 1-85828-404-X Jeffrey, Keith, 2010. MI6, The History of the Secret Intelligence Service, 1909-1949. London, Bloomsbury. ISBN 978-0-7475-9183-2. Judd, Allen The Quest for C., Sir Mansfield Cumming and the Founding of the British Secret Service, London, HarperCollins, ISBN 0-00-255901-3 Quinlan, Kevin the Secret War Between the Wars, MI5 in the 1920s and the 1930s. Bowyer. ISBN 978-1-84383-938-5. 
Seeger, Kirsten Olstrup, 2008. Friendly Fire, DK. ISBN 978-87-7799-193-6. A biography of the author's father, who was a member of the Danish resistance during the Second World War. Smith, Michael, 2010. 6. A History of Britain's Secret Intelligence Service, PT1, Murder and Mayhem, 1909 to 1939. London, Dialogue. ISBN 9781906447007. Seven. Smiley, Colonel David, 1994. Irregular Regular. Norwich, Editions Michael Russell. ISBN 0-85955-202-0. An Autobiography of a British Officer, Honorary Colonel of the Royal Horse Guards, David de Crespigny Smiley Lvo, Ob, MC, who served in the Special Operations Executive during World War II Albania, Thailand, and was a MI6 officer after war Poland, Malta, Oman, Yemen. Tomlinson, Richard, Nick Fielding 2001. The Big Breach, From Top Secret to Maximum Security. Mainstream Publishing ISBN 1-903813-01-8 Vilazi, Kelowna A. 2013. The History of Me 6, Penguin Group Publishing, UK, USA Release Walton, Calder 2012. Empire of Secrets. London, Harper Press. ISBN 978 0 West, N. 1988 The Friends, Britain's Post-War Secret Intelligence Operations, London, Weidenfeld and Nicholson, ISBN 978-0297794301 West, N. 2006 At Her Majesty's Secret Service, The Chiefs of Britain's Intelligence Agency, MI6, London, Greenhill ISBN 978-1853677 7021 Winterbotham, F. W. 1974, the Ultra Secret, New York, Harper & Row, ISBN 978-0-06-014678-8 Topic External links Official website Information about CIS. Archived from the original on 25 August 2007, from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office's website BBC Interview with MI6 Spy. BBC's The One Show Presenter Interviews MI6 Spy.